Good morning, designers. Thank and afternoon to those of you joining and tuning in live from the East Coast. I'm very grateful that Anna Brockway is joining us live from San Francisco. And Anna Brockway is the co-founder of Cherish, which if you don't know about it, you should know. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce Anna, and then we're going to get right into our conversation today about turning a passion into a career. So Anna Brockway wants to make home decorating personal. In 2013, she co-founded Cherish, the design lover's indispensable online source for the chic and unique items that brings one-of-a-kind style to home design. Prior to founding Cherish, Anna was the VP of Worldwide Marketing at Levi Strauss. She holds a BA in art history from Columbia University. Known for her marketing expertise and her amazing smashing style, which you can tell today by how gorgeous she looks, and she always looks, taste-making style and let's try it attitude, Anna lives in San Francisco with her husband and Cherish co-founder, Greg, and their three children. So welcome, Anna. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Hi, everybody. <laughs> and what we will be covering today, one, how to turn a concept into a business, Two, streamlining the way designers source and design. And three, how to scale your business in an efficient way and knowing how to make difficult business decisions. So right off the get-go, I really am dying to ask you, Anna. We all want to hear. People have been text messaging me, emailing me. How did you turn this concept of antiquing into a full-fledged business? Yeah. Well, first off, thanks for having me. Um, hi, everybody. Um, so my ex um, reason for starting Cherish was really based on personal experience, which is I am a professed um, compulsive redecorator. Um, and Risa, you know this about me, but I've moved a lot and every move was an opportunity to, you know, move things around, as they say. And so I just learned firsthand how hard it was to source really great design online um, and particularly in the vintage and antique space, um, as well as software. And stuff and so after just getting super frustrated with it um, I turned to my husband and said you know somebody should start a website that does this and he's like yeah that's somebody's to you and so together we sort of um, started it right there in my dining room um, and when we first launched Cherish it was a, it was really focused on individuals selling to other individuals so it was about me having items in my house like a sofa I bought for a home that we moved out of that was a lovely piece just was like, you know, it was a foot and a half too short for my new living room. And like, what do you do with those pieces? Because I found that consignment shops were hard because they just have such limited foot traffic. Um, and they take a 50% commission or more. So um, the idea was to use the, you know, the internet essentially as a better way to sell to other people who were looking for nice things and really create a more premium and home focused experience than what you might find on something like eBay. Um, and so that's what we did. And what we quickly found out is, is that professional sellers, which is our sort of internal term for vintage stores and antique dealers and interior designers who have um, really great tastes and large lots of um, stuff, also were looking for a place to sell. And so they started to join us. So now about 90% of our inventory comes from uh, professional sellers and about 10% comes from private individuals. And how we how we decided to get it started was really just, I mean, it was it was a little scary, um, but we kind of um, galvanized a team of people that Greg and I had worked with before at other stages in our life and career. And we're like, hey, who wants to try this? And we're able to put something together. The first version of the site was built on an off-the-shelf software product, Shopify. Um, and we sort of hacked around with it to help make it a little more customized for our business model, but not a ton. And um, that's how we got started. It was in my dining room. I remember the, the first website. I think you had the orange banner. Am I right? Oh, ah! I mean, it was so bad. But I'll tell you, one of the really interesting things about it. So coming from the fashion industry, I had, I had worked on ad campaigns where, you know, you're retouching and recoloring and making everything perfect. I know you come from that world, too. And it's like the idea that, you know, you were going to put something out there that looked and felt so homemade was really hard for me. I had this natural desire to want to hire huge design teams and, you know, photographers and all this great stuff to make it look beautiful. But I think one of the things that um, my co-founder and my husband, Greg, advised me, advised really well on was the first thing to figure out before we spend all that time and all that money and put all those resources in it is, does this like model and this idea even work? 
So you kind of want something that's just good enough to kind of test it as a hypothesis. You can always add all that stuff in, and clearly we did, but we sort of learned a lot cheaply first and then figured out what needed to be perfected and built on from there. So that's, that's kind of the approach that we took. That's really interesting. And that actually segues into my next question, which was working with a co-founder. What's the process like? How many people did you have when you first started Cherish? And I think it segues right to our designer audience as well. Starting a design business is kind of a lot of designers have this really strong love for design, but then they start their business and it's a whole different ball game than they thought maybe they initially were signing up for. Yeah. And I'm sure you couldn't even imagine, you know, what you were about to embark on when you started this out of your dining room it's kind of there's a lot of parallels and i know sometimes designers have said hey or like chatted in our facebook group like hey like i'm thinking of teaming up with my designer best friend like what's that process going to look like so i think it's interesting for you because your co-founder was your husband who obviously yeah. has a lot of knowledge and extensive and us wild dreamers like i'm the same as you having the whole design and the photography like bringing us down to this real level of like, okay, calm down. Let's think this through first. Right. But what was that process like for you? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's, it's a really interesting one because we're also married, right? So that's like a whole nother TV show. Um, <laughs> but what I would say that worked really well and that I would advise is a lot of people want to start things with their friends who like the same things as they do. And um, of course, it's important that you guys have shared values and a vision for what you want for the business. But it's also really helpful to have somebody with a complementary skill set that's not duplicative of what you bring to the table. So my background um, running marketing for Levi's was really in, um, well, in marketing and in advertising and in publicity, and also have a very strong point of view regarding taste level and curation. Um, and um, design and Greg's is in um, technology and engineering and developing um, sort of the back end plumbing of sites that helps mm -hmm. to um, create and um, allow for scale behind sites. Mm -hmm. So I think having that as a um, complement to what I brought to it was really important and helped to measure um, my design. So example, um, I talked about how he um, encouraged us to launch before visually and aesthetically I thought the site was ready to. Yeah. He also will, and he's talked about this in interviews as well, he will credit that I was the one who said the site has to be curated. We can't just accept every single item that somebody decides they want to sell through us because then the site looks junky and it's not a fun place to shop and it really has no reason for being because those sites already exist. Um, there's large marketplaces that address that. So, you know, it's an example of where having my sense of um, curation and style focus balanced with his sense of speed and learning and the experience from his technology background, the two of those together were really complementary. So that that's something I would really um, encourage people to think about is what do you not have and go out and look for that in, a, in, in someone. Okay, that's interesting. How many employees did you have when you first started Cherish? Uh, there were two. There was Greg and I, and it was mostly <laughs> me at the time. Um, and then very quickly we brought on um, Andy Denmark, who's our CTO, and he, he was someone that um, Greg had worked with before. And then Eric Grossa, who um, works with us now in sort of leads operations, and he's somebody who we'd all worked with before. Um, and then almost immediately we brought on um, Muggs Buckley, who works who's somebody who I just known for a really long time and who had worked in the marketing and media space and a bunch of other people. But it really started as the two of us and then expanded to four, um, the four co-founders. And, and that's sort of how it got going. Okay. And as I said before, you know, you're an inspiration to so many designers, mothers, businesswomen. I got a lot of feedback for questions of how do you, and I know you posted something on Instagram that made me yeah. laugh, but how do you manage it all? You know, I know that, because I know you personally as well, that you had this career where you were traveling all the time, and then you took some time to have kids, and then all of a sudden, not, not too far after you had your youngest, you had, and you have twins. I mean, it's a lot. It's a juggle, and it's a struggle, and I think that... I see so many designers really struggling with how to really run that prop, not just like a halfway business, a profitable business 
be smart, run employees, like the type of management, like especially for you, that's why I asked about the employees because now you guys have grown tremendously and you're really managing all of these people. And I just see so many designers get so burnt out. So we would love your kind of advice and feedback of how you do it at all or like what things you actually were able to outsource in terms of your household even to allow you to lead this company. Yeah. Um, so uh, just a quick background. Um, when I left Levi's, I had my first kid. Um, then my sister, who's a lot younger than me, she was 13 at the time, came to live with us full time. And six months after that, we found out we were having twins. So we went from having no kids to four kids in um, about 24 months. Um, and I decided that at that point, it made sense for me to stay home and just focus on getting the kids properly launched. And so I spent actually 10 years not working. Um, so there's a big gap in my work experience between my time at Levi's and, and the founding of Cherish. Um, so I'm, I just like to be honest about that because I wasn't doing this with a baby on my hip. You know, when, when we started Cherish, my kids were in school full time and my sister had left for college and um, for me, that was the signal that it was the right time for me to make, you know, I felt like I had the bandwidth to tackle it. So um, I, I just wanted to share that in terms of, I didn't, um, I think that kind of recognizing you don't have to have everything all at once is also um, part of my story and my own personal philosophy and experience. Having said that, even with um, the support of all those things, it's hard. There's no doubt about it. And I was just talking with Britt Morin about this topic, about you know this kind of fallacy that you're going to be able to do everything and um, not need any help and just figure it out. And so I'm a huge fan of outsourcing. Um, I have all kinds of tricks I use to do that, which I'm happy to talk about in a second. Um, I have, um, and I'm also super organized. Like I can tell you where our family's going on vacation in eight months. Like I have to plan that far ahead, um, which makes life a little bit less spontaneous and fun than I would like sometimes, but I'm really kind of live and die by the calendar. And I probably spend 40 minutes every morning while I'm commuting in on the calendar, just moving things and trying to arrange stuff so that um that's part of it um in terms of tips and tricks i would offer the first thing is i only cook once a week okay. i cook on sunday and i cook from 12 slash one o'clock to about four o'clock and i cook everything we're going to eat for the whole week and i put it in the fridge or i put it in the freezer um that's just like this thing that I do. I love it. I turn on the music. I pour myself a glass of wine. Yes, at one o'clock on a Sunday. And <laughs> I turn on my show or whatever I want to do. And I get it done. So that gets that out of the way. I have help that picks up the kids after school um, and helps get them to their activities because I can't do that if I'm at work. Um, and I um, look for ways to outsource pretty much anything that involves my kids that they won't know that I'm not there. So right. I don't do volunteer stuff at school unless I know they're there. I'm pretty focused about what I sign up for. Um, my quote that I put on Instagram, which I actually got from my friend Christy Ritt, which is so great, is women are expected to work like they don't have kids and then are expected to have kids like they don't raise their kids like they don't work. And it's really frustrating. And so I don't have the answer. I think my kids definitely see that there's a difference now that I'm at Cherish than when I was staying at home full time. And I'm actually okay with that. I think that, you know, this is part of my life. This is how most people are. And I, particularly for my daughter, but also for my sons, love that they see what it's like to have, that women do this and women start things and they run them. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a good answer. And I know from back in the day, you are a fabulous cook. So it's amazing that you actually can block out that time when your family knows that, you know, this is your time and this is the way that it runs and getting, you know, we talk so much about to designers. I have this conversation with designers about calendar blocking and not letting your clients overtake your schedule. And I think it's yes. the same thing for you as if you really live and die by that calendar and you treat your clients just like your, their, your family, your family knows your calendar. They know when you're at work and you don't cross those lines. Obviously if your kids have an emergency, it's a little bit different than your clients, but it's just sure. about respecting your time. And I think that that's what I hear designers complain about the most. So I think it's interesting to hear from you, your perspective on it and yeah the other thing i think is helpful i don't know if this is helpful to designers but 
I try to think about, it's really easy for me to come into the office just once I'm here and kind of try to do everything every day. And I think that's a mistake. I think it's good if you can say Tuesdays are for billing, Wednesdays are for sourcing, Thursdays and Fridays are for client meetings. I mean, I know that's hard because you're, you are at the whim of your client's availability too. But I mean, if you can kind of stay focused like that and create those routines, it also keeps you, I think, focus on, you don't feel as overwhelmed because you're like, I'm going to do that on Tuesday. Like I'm going to do this on Thursday and you can kind of keep track of things and manage them that way versus trying to do all things all the time. You know, of course, and setting the expectations, like you said, if your clients know, like, this is your day, this is your option. And right. before you hire on that client, that's, that's what it's going to look like. It's running your type of business. And I'm sure you function in that way. And it's just setting those expectations, which will set you up for success. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay, and now for the craziest question I'm probably going to ask you. It's not that crazy. Um, just kind of, I think that designers face this a lot too when they're first getting started and would love to hear from you kind of your biggest mistake or your biggest obstacle, either one, um, and how you learned from that from the get-go or even midway because obviously we're not perfect, right? Obviously anything can change at any given time, but I think that it's helpful to know and for everybody to know like it doesn't matter – what type of business you're running that everybody makes mistakes and that we learn from mistakes. So it'd be helpful to hear. Oh my gosh. So many mistakes. <laughs> Where do I start? <laughs> um, gosh. Well, I mean, one of the biggest mistakes I think I had was um, when I didn't know something. Well, I, I think, I think one of the biggest mistakes I had, I don't know if it's a mistake or just, it's like a, it was, was a lack of confidence in certain areas. So one thing that I, at the beginning I felt really nervous about was the whole finance thing. It's like, mm -hmm. clearly I'm come from a creative background. Um, it's not that I'm not capable of it. It's just not something that I enjoy. Um, and so I found it was really easy to kind of like push that off onto other parts of the business or other people. And that was a huge mistake. And I've learned that I have to learn stuff. I, didn't necessarily want, know or didn't necessarily want to learn um, and force myself to do it. And now I actually enjoy that. So I think thinking about um, what is it that you're afraid of and that you kind of want to get rid of and you secretly don't want to own that, own that. <laughs> so that's my, that's my first piece of advice. But you know, what's so interesting about that on it directly parallels to a and I don't want to stereotype designers, but these are just conversations that I have. You know me, I'm like at every yeah. design event, talking to designers all the time. And that's the number one thing that they talk about is I got into this industry. I really want to design. I don't want to deal with any of the numbers. I don't want to look at it. Um, it's overwhelming. I don't understand. I don't have the time and I don't necessarily want to understand. I think owning that, like you said, and facing your fears will help you run a profitable interior design business. It's not a hobby job. It's a serious business that you're running. And without looking at those financials, you're not going to get to that profitable place. Yes. And you will find that it also makes you more creative yeah. because there's nothing worse than operating with anxiety. And so the extent to which you can get ahead of that, address it, push yourself through it. It's such a liberation. It really is. And so I, I, I agree with you and strongly encourage people to do that. And again, that doesn't, it's funny saying that and also saying that you should look for a partner who has complementary skills. I mean, coming from the fashion business, any really major fashion designer usually has a right hand business person who works alongside them. You know, Valentino had one, YSL had one, um, a lot, you know, Caroline Herrera had one. I mean, most of the really big people do. And I think that's also true within the design industry. When you really get to know people's offices, there's usually a left and right hand person. But in the beginning stages, you can't always have that. And so you have to embrace that. And that will also help you when you are ready to find that person to know what you're looking for and, and what's required. So I think that's really important. Um, other big mistakes I made. Oh, God. Um, one of them was, um, I think at the beginning we felt that, um, there were moments where I felt like we didn't necessarily own a hundred percent, um, what the brand sort of could be. I think I, sometimes we were a little mousy in how we came out and talked about ourselves mm -hmm. and we kind of got, 
um, I call it Jim Belushi syndrome, which is when you're not John Belushi, you're his younger brother, Jim. And there's been some really big players in the category um, around us, um, you know, eBay. I mean, there's a lot, there's tons of huge players. And I think we sort of um, suffered a little bit from the, um, the Jim Belushi complex at times with people like that. And so I think we're well over that. I hope we're well over that, but we definitely had those moments too, where it's a little bit of an inferiority complex. Um, so, and that came out in a variety of different ways, but it was a general theme, which is, you know, show up and do your best and, and never be, um, never be shy about that. That's good advice. It's funny because you're like reading my mind because my next question was, you know, how did you really establish that brand identity from where you came from? Sorry, I have to say that on the orange web banner website, yeah. because I remember that first app and right. to where you guys are now. And I think your brand is super recognizable. People know it. And I think that's also really important for designers to understand and branding. And because they're so in over their head that they don't even think about, oh, like, some designers I know don't even have a website. They just have an Instagram page, you know, and yeah. I do think for SEO purposes and driving your business yeah. and getting the right type of clients that a website is still pertinent, but it takes time. And I think that also designers sometimes see price tags and they're like, ah, oh, this is really scary. I don't know because maybe they're not looking at their financials. Everything kind of is a domino effect. But where did you guys really get to in your business where you're like, okay, we really need to figure out our brand identity and how has that served you now? Yeah. I mean, I think at, at probably about a year into it, we started to see where the business model was and then started to develop the brand more um, significantly around that. And I think it was really about spending time with our customers, both buyers and sellers, and hearing what they liked and didn't like about the brand. And also, you know, the brand, I have to be honest, is very much a personal expression of me. I mean, my voice is in the brand. Um, I, the What goes on the site and what goes off the site c comes a lot from me um, in terms of what types of inventory we offer. And I guess for me personally, one of the things that has always been the goal with Cherish has been to be great design that doesn't feel intimidating. So one of the things I, and this is partly coming from my experience working on a fashion brand like Levi's, which is a very open brand and a very democratic brand. I felt like there's so much in the home category and in fashion and really any image-based businesses that are all about telling people how they're supposed to be and kind of looking down on them. And my thing was always, I wanted to be the kind of brand that was ahead of you, but not above you. So we wanted to provide leadership and inspiration and ideas and make people excited about decorating their house and designing their home in a way that felt unique and individual and personalized to them. We have internally, we jokingly call it, you know, end the McLiving room, which is the, you know, the living room that everybody else has and yeah. make something personally your own. And so for us, that's about having a brand that's open hearted, that's adventurous and curious. Um, that, and that's also chic and tasteful, but that's not, um, but that comes from a place of um, accessibility. And so I think that um, for us, um, those things just kind of naturally came out of the expression of having a marketplace, which is what we are, and also my own personal philosophy about design and what I heard people were looking for, which is they didn't need another snobby shop. You know, there's plenty of those. Mm -hmm. um, they wanted a place where they felt that um, discovery was encouraged and that the whole thing felt quite spirited and fun. And so that's that's what we've tried to build. Well, you guys are doing a good job of it. And, and speaking of your um, working on your own design projects, because your taste is impeccable, your style is impeccable, and we know that you designed and remodeled your own home. Tell us something you wish you would have known, like when you started your own home project. Um, and even so, like, I don't, I don't think you ever started and stopped. I think it's always been like an ongoing process for you. <laughs> <laughs> but just sure. what as uh, and then you know I know later you um you did have a designer come in and help you um and things that you loved about the process things that you wish would have been different because so I think that that feedback is really important for designers as well um I actually worked with a designer I worked with Stephanie Philibrant from Marshall Clark Design who's also a dear friend who helped us a ton and our um architect was Steven Sutro so let me give them their props and their team and Crown yeah. Construction um, was my was my um, contractor partner. Amazing. So for me, um, the main thing was 
and this gets to my time thing. Well, the first one was I wanted to work with a team of people who knew each other really well, um, mm -hmm. got along and had worked on projects before and had a mutual respect for each other. So I mm -hmm. talked to contractors um, and architects who the, the triangle wasn't right. And the last thing I wanted was a bunch of this from people pointing at each other. So that was the first thing. The second one was we pretty much designed the entire house almost a year in advance and bought all the materials and put them in a warehouse. Um, because I had to move out of the house, which was quite expensive and disruptive to the family. And so I didn't want to be in a position where people were saying, well, we can't finish this because the tile's not here or you didn't choose the handles right. So pretty much with one exception of a pair of door handles that took almost a year and a half to get right, which was amazing. Um, and I, that was, that's what I was afraid of. Um, yeah. Pretty much everything was done almost, yeah, six months to a year in advance, picked out, then ordered, then stockpiled. So I didn't have any um, slowdown. So we did a full gut remodel, the four story exactly. house in about 11, 10 or 11 months. So that, that was amazing. So he could just go. And um, of course there's always surprises. What I wish I had spent more time on, Stephanie tried to talk me into using a lighting designer and I didn't, and I should have, like that was stupid. Um, <laughs> like it's, see, it's one of those things where at the time you're like, oh God, it's another bill. Do I really need it? And now I'm looking back and I'm like, what's more important than lighting? Like it's so essential. That was a mistake. I wish I'd done that differently. Um, you mean like a lighting designer to like design special pieces for you or like even figure out where to put cans and that kind of stuff? Where to or put all. cans, what wattage, which type of lighting. It's a whole thing, you know? And I don't it's know that. It's when you're in the process. And that's actually interesting because it's a hard conversation for designers to have with their clients because like you said, clients don't always understand that value. And then once you get in the house and you live in the house, you're like, why is there a can right here? And like, that doesn't make sense. There's yeah. really true, there's, it's a specialty service that I 100% yeah. agree. And oddly, also on lighting, while we're on it, Greg um, felt really strongly that we needed to have one of these sophisticated lighting systems, whose brand name I will not mention, um, where, you know, you can, run it from your phone and do all this stuff. And it, I was like, I just don't get that. Like, I just want to turn off my lights. Like yeah. I, I can, I can work a dimmer. Like I can yeah. do that. And, and, um, and he really, really pushed for it. And I have to say, it's been an enormous pain in the ass. And like, I just want a normal, like I should have hired the designer and had regular lights instead of the sophisticated system that I can control from, you know, the East Coast, like who cares? <laughs> so, so that would be my other thing is um, that that's one thing I, I would have switched the priority on that. Got it. That makes yeah. sense. And then, what about um, the process of working with your design? Once you hire the team, you I think it's really smart to have everything shipped to a warehouse. Good advice for our designers listening. Then you're really not waiting on anybody. But anything else in the process of working with a designer that you're like, oh, that was amazing, or oh, like I wish I would have known this before I started this process. I had a really great experience. I love my team. They were fantastic. Um. I did spend a lot of time. I'm such a control freak. I'm sorry, but I am. That's why I was asking you this question because you are asking me. It's like I'm, I'm like telling you the story. Like God, I hate me right now. But anyways, I, like, I totally hate me. But I did. Um, I did put together like a full briefing document, the same way that if I were briefing an ad agency or I were briefing a designer on a website project. Like, here's what I like. Here's what I don't like. Um. You know, and I use that as a screening device when I was meeting with people. Um, so that worked really well. And then I just had a standing appointment once a week, two hours on site. The whole team was required to be there. And that's how we worked together. So um, that worked really well for me. Yeah. Organization is key. Yeah. And like it does, I feel like you are, you were the client and you're even saying like micromanaging a little bit to a point, like, you know, it, it did pay off in the end because you got what you wanted in the timeline that you want. Because so many times designers and I see complaining about the process and this and this person and pointing fingers, but that key dynamic between the architect, the builder, the designer, and the client is essential 
to getting things done on time. Yeah, I just wanted to team. So like my background is making commercials for the Super Bowl, right? So you don't hire a director and hire a different editor and hire another DP and have a stylist and have the five people never have worked together and not know each other and a set designer who nobody knows. Like that you will never get, you will never get on air. Um, so the idea for what we were trying to do was sort of to create that, that um, familiarity mm -hmm. and creative, shared creative vision and um, set of goals. And I never met with anybody without all three there. That's, That's the other smart. One. Then nobody yep. can put fingers at each other and everybody's on the same page. Everyone's in the room. Yeah. And, and you, of course, just going back to like what we were talking about before, you took on this construction project after Cherish had already been in existence and you guys kind of had stability and you had employees, correct? You weren't trying to manage the construction. Cherish was about, Cherish was about a year old. So it was oh. a little crazy, um, which is probably why I was such a freak about it. Maybe not. Maybe I would have been anyways. <laughs> World first client. <laughs> but yeah, and then what I know we were just talk, chatting a little bit about then you also moved your office. So you were in one location for um, up until recently and you moved your office location. So what was that like in terms of moving your company and maybe hiring more employees? Um, tell us about that process. Yeah, it's been really fun. Um, we were in a really beautiful office space at 570 Pacific for a long time, which is owned by my dear friends um, from Grow Marketing who are fantastic people. Um, and you know, we, we moved in really quickly. I mean, the challenge with moving offices is it's like, you always are in this rush. Like you have to get in and your lease is expiring and it takes forever to find the right place. And then you're like in this huge rush. So, um, you kind of do what you can to make it feel like home. And then, you know, it's just, I don't know, it's, it, it's hard. You don't, you don't have that year to put stuff in think through it. It's, it's a much more like kamikaze process. I worked with Stephanie again, cause I, we knew each other and so well and kind of knew the process and how it would go. Yeah. Um, and the thing that's kind of neat about our office is I really wanted to have a big kitchen cause I wanted to bring all the people who work in disparate parts of the company together regularly. I mean, everybody needs a coffee, right? And so when you walk into our office, there's this huge kitchen um and with a bar and then a huge like cafe area with little chairs and this super long benches um so it's almost feels a little bit more like a um i guess it's a little bit like a restaurant almost when you walk in um but i wanted it to feel i didn't want to come in and have it you know be a bunch of workstations although we have a lot of them but they're yeah. kind of you know in a separate area and so that was yeah. really important to me was to try to find ways to bring the company together. It's really easy to have engineers over here and product people over here and marketing people in yet another place and sales people. You know, it's like, how do we all get to know each other outside of sitting in meetings? And so, you know, it's great to do it around lunch and coffee and stuff like that. That's awesome. I need to come check out the new office yes. space. Yeah. <laughs> and Still and way to go. <laughs> Sure, there's always room for improvement. But it's interesting because, you know, a lot of designers, I think that the aspect of community and even in your community, your culture, bonding people together is the same with designers. And what we tried to do is really, and you know, we're big on this in the Ivy community is host events, bring designers together because they don't have that everyday workflow where they're chatting with their co-worker or this you know it might be a one woman show even if they have two people it still gets to feel really isolating so mm -hmm. i like that idea of like really building that community whether it's within your own company or meeting with your friends every week and really sharing ideas and connecting on like a deeper level yes. um, i think it's so important I, the tech industry is actually good at doing this they get together entrepreneurs are getting together all the time and talking to each other and even if they're somewhat competitors you know you have you it's just part of what happens and it's a unique i think it's fashion business is not like that you know it's a unique thing about technology that i think is really special and makes people love working in it um and i you know i'm always like so blown away when i go to legends at la cienega lcdq or i go to um what's new and what's next in new york or um Southern style now down in um, Nashville. Like designers want to get together. We love getting them together. You guys love getting them to get together. I mean, people like that sense of community. 
Um, and that's, and, and at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. I think taking it back a little bit to, you know, where you grew with your business, did you have somebody that was your mentor that helped you through your processes or were you just like, I had this idea and you ran with it? Um, yeah, you know what? I'm really lucky that, um, Kevin and Julia Hartz, who are the co-founders of Eventbrite, are old, old friends. Kevin and I actually kind of grew up together. And so we've known each other for a really long time. They're also husband and wife founders of a business. Yes. And they've been incredibly um, helpful. Not so much about you should do this on, you know, right now, but more just talking philosophically about working with your spouse, but also about just um, when I've needed advice on specific problems that we're having or questions, they've just been incredibly supportive and wonderful. And and I think Julia is like, if you're looking for a role model on balancing work and family, I think I think she's a great one. Um, yeah. And, 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 and has been for me, for sure. That's awesome. I mean, I definitely think that it, that's really the sense is that if there is a newer designer and somebody has a question, that these designers are mentoring these younger designers. And that's what it's all about. At the end of the day, there's enough work for everybody to go around. For you, like, you use Eventbrite all the time. There's no, It's not competition. It's really community over competition. And right. finding that that person that can be your voice to bounce ideas off of will really help you take this concept or your design business or whatever it is that you're starting to that next level and make it a real thing. Agree. And so I was going to ask in terms of like running your business and really getting your business to where it is today, how has technology played a big role for you guys? And you guys, I think there's so much technology that you have on a day-to-day -day basis and you are a tech, you have an app, you have all of these crazy things. Um, I mean, imagine you wouldn't be able to have Cherish before you, when you started Cherish, you, it's, it, it's, I think you guys were on the cutting edge of where people really started adopting technology. Designers used to write like invoices, like on paper and pen, you know, like everything kind of changed. Yeah. And that's yeah. I mean, a couple of things to know, just in terms of a general background and context, um, the largest, the fastest growing e-commerce category online right now is the home category. So it's a really big category. We got into it fortunately early, um, but it's been one of, you know, pretty much, you know, fashion went online, travel went online, groceries have now gone online and home is still only 10% of the business is done online. I, I, it will never be a hundred percent, but yeah. it's, it's still early innings, as we say, into moving into the online um, space. And I think it's just so amazing. Like when you think about the idea that, um, you know, for us, for example, in our app that we're able to show you, let you drop an item in, in your space so you can virtually kind of try it out before you buy it. I don't care if you're in a furniture store or if you're online, that's helpful, you know, for a lot of people, especially when you're trying out paintings and art and stuff like that. The idea of having virtual design tools, I think is really amazing. But even more like basic than that, the idea that we can have now 300,000 one of a kind items on a site and you can, you know, write in camel mohair and have come up exactly what you're looking for. And with a click of a button, be able to make an offer or buy that and have it someone else figure out how to ship it to you. It's such an incredible convenience factor. Mm -hmm. um, our hope is, is that where this all goes is it allows design and beautiful homes and the idea of the fun really of creating them to be part of more people's lives um, and feel less episodic in terms of people's lives. Like my mom always jokes that like she, did her living room in 1985 and then said to my dad, like, well, we do it in 1995. It was like, that's how you thought about it. It's like this, you know, and I think that's relatively frequent, you know, a lot of people live with it for 20 years. And so it's this idea that um, hopefully through all of this, we can make change easier. We can make individuality and the expression of that through home design easier, the same way it is, you know, in fashion, you want it to look like just your style. It's kind of the same idea at home. And so that's really the, I think, what's powerful about all of this. The thing that really warms my heart about it has been the idea that there's all these individual sellers out there who have great stuff and thanks to us are now able to kind of have this be their hustle and they're able to make this into their business. And probably of all the stuff I hear about Cherish, and that's the thing that I'm like in many ways the most proud of is, is that it's enabled people to have a line of work and a career that they care about and love and are passionate about um, 
because it's given them access to buyers and, and kind of created a marketplace for them. So that's been really cool. That's awesome. You must be reading my mind. So I was going to ask you what was your proudest moment. But um, the other thing, and there's a couple I've been asking questions as they've been coming in. But if anybody else has any other questions, feel free to just um, hit the button below that says ask a question. But I've definitely been asking them as they've come in. Um, if you could go back and tell yourself one thing before you started kind of the second piece of your career, what would it be? I think it would have been to not and this might be just because of who I am, but it would have been to not assume that somebody else has it all figured out. You know, I think, um, I think also maybe because I, I was out of the working world for 10 years, I kind of was like, everybody else probably knows how to do this. Mm -hmm. And the thing, and it, it's partially also, I think a product of our time right now where everything's changing so quickly, but nobody knows. <laughs> I mean, that's the thing is like, nobody really knows what's going on. You know, I mean, everybody is figuring this out and making mistakes and also having successes as they go. And so this notion that, um, you know, there's some Yoda out there who knows it all, you know, everyone's stumbling into this and, and um, I think it's always going to be like that because of the speed at which we now operate and how much change there is in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And so I see a lot of people sitting on the sidelines or kind of like we were at times maybe acting a little bit mousy because yeah. they're like, mm, I'm not sure. It's like, it's okay to not be sure. Like yeah. having that sense of uncertainty was really hard for me to live with. And, um, and I had to get over that. <laughs> Just being super honest about that, you know? Totally. And, and last, last question that I want to ask you um, is from one of a designer, actually, I think you know. Um, there's so much pressure for designers to have an edge to come out with new design season after season. What advice would you give to young designers just starting out and hoping to profit in this industry? Can you ask me the question again? Yeah. There's so much pressure for designers to have an edge and come out with new designs season after season. What advice would you give to younger designers just starting out and hoping to profit in this industry? I would say do the best work that you can and don't operate on other people's timelines. I mean, I see a lot of people doing stuff because they feel pressured into doing things. Yeah. Um, you have to have great work and you have to feel good about it. And it's all, there's always going to be compromises involved in that. But I think you have to take things and take projects and do work that you feel fundamentally comfortable with and not spend a lot of time worrying about what other people think. I mean, I had a lot of anxiety about that too when we launched Cherish. And I felt very insecure about how the site looked and also like, do I want to be the person who like sells used sofas? Is that my goal in life? And it's like... Oh kind of yeah like i like it you know and so you gotta you gotta just kind of know who you are and what you're comfortable with and get your head around that i i wouldn't spend a lot of time looking over your shoulder because to my point they don't necessarily have the answer you know <laughs> i think i think um being deliberate and staying focused and knowing kind of what feels right for you and evaluating that as things change is probably the most important thing hope that That's makes great. sense and then actually, this is my last question, because I know you have to scoot here in a second. But how do you because I know, obviously, I follow and get your blast and I have designers ask me all the time, how does a designer have the opportunity to get featured on your website or in a blog post or all the fun stuff that you guys do? Yeah. featuring designers? Great question. I should have started with that. Sorry. Um, no. So our list, our site, we're now at a little over 2 million shoppers a month. So it's great publicity and exposure for designers to be featured on Cherish. And we love them. Okay. Awesome. That makes sense. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. We know you're really busy and um, such helpful information for designers to really understand. And I think the biggest takeaway I want designers to remember is looking at your financials like that. Don't shy away from it. Face your fears because if Anna did it, you can do it. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. 
It's not going to go away if you didn't look at it. <laughs> so running a business, you can't run a business without really understanding what those numbers mean. It's not a business, then it's a hobby. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, awesome. Well, thank you so much, on I really appreciate it. I miss you so much. Thank you for having me. Of course. <laughs> Bye. Okay. And for those of you that are still with us and you want to learn a little bit more about Ivy, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and just show you a little bit about what our software can offer you. Um, and I actually just want to tell you a couple things that will allow you to really manage your business in a super efficient way. So. Ivy is a cloud-based software, and really, we want to help you be smart about managing your profits, getting to a you know 40% gross profit margin. That is really key for you. We give you tools that allow you to track your time and really allow you to stay focused on design. We also have an IV Clipper, which will allow you to go into your project proposal. For example, I can show you right here on Cherish's website. And it will allow you to clip items directly from a vendor's website. You can clip the product title, you can clip the category, you can add your cost, markup, you can add vendors, and you can pre-populate all of your vendors in the system as well. And then you can add a description and you can add the full product details. So that is super helpful and allows you to really gather all of the information in one place. And then you can create your own custom tear sheets with your logo, your branding. Again, looking professional is really key. So even if you're just starting out, you can have your own branded documents that will allow you to really take your business on that next level. And I think that there's a lot of key aspects that we as designers forget about um, outsourcing having somebody do drawings for you, all sorts of this piece of the business that will allow you to focus on design and really take your business to that next level. So thank you again for joining us today. If you do want to go ahead and learn more about Ivy, you can go ahead and click the green button and schedule a one-on-one -on -one consultation with us. And thank you again. We will see you soon. Bye.